You know how photographers in a group photo will be like, okay, now for a silly one. That's like what this episode feels like. (laughs) I love that. I love that so much. During COVID, I got really big into the online book binding fan fiction community. (laughs) And so I have an entire bookshelf of (laughs) all handbound fan fiction of Harry Potter fan fiction. Aaron, that's incredible like, if you ever want to do a cracked episode of this we should both get stoned <laughs> and you should have to read a no context harry potter fan fiction so that we can talk about it oh absolutely i'm gonna intro the podcast so quick because my dad is gonna be like what's happening Aaron?" Welcome to Required Reading, the podcast that revisits uh, the most impactful books from our childhood. I'm your host, Erin Bowles. I am a writer, actor, and comedian, and I have a kitten staring me down, but she's also falling asleep. Our guest today is Adrian Vento. They are a Nashville-based New Yorker who creates ads by day and music by night. They're one of my favorite people, and they did our third episode, Cupid Doesn't Flip Hamburgers. Hello! Hey, it's so great to be back. And I think I said this last time too, but in your intro, you say most impactful books of your childhood. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I think I missed that memo because I just picked a book. I mean, I love this. And it's a good one. But it is just so funny to measure impact. No, this was delightful because I read this in between the last lecture which just came out yesterday which is like a memoir from a man with terminal cancer and then he went to scarlet letter and then this one and then 13 reasons why <laughs> they just keep coming but today's episode is about the mercy watson books by kate de camillo who is one of only six authors in existence to have won the newberry medal twice She won uh, once for The Tale of Despero, which we did on this podcast, and another book called Flora and Ulysses, which I just looked up, is about a girl and a squirrel. Perfect. (laughs) When Adrian reached out to me, they said, do you want to do Mercy Watson Goes for a Ride? And I said, yes, I want to talk to you about dust bunnies. Yeah. But I had never heard of these books, and I heard the name Mercy Watson goes for a ride. And I was like, oh, this is absolutely, without a doubt, about a like 17th century Amish girl named Mercy Watson who's riding on a broomstick <laughs> to a coven at night. And it's not. And you should write that book. Because yeah. honestly, I think what should come from this podcast long term is that you should just become a children's book author because you would be absolutely phenomenal at it. You are doing market research right now. And I can just imagine you writing a book like this because there are some insane vocabulary in these books that just remind me of the way you talk. Like one character always is like folly. And I was like, that's Aaron. That's Aaron (laughs) right there. (laughs) When we were in college, Adrian would call me a feminist Snapple cap. (laughs) I forgot about that. (laughs) Or I think it might have been feminist film Snapple Cap, which is even more accurate. More niche. I was just thinking about this today. I don't think we actually brag enough about this anymore, but we did win a handful of regional student Emmys together. On one hand, we don't brag enough about it. On the other hand, whenever anyone says anything to me, I go, okay, but did you know I won an Emmy? (laughs) <laughs> like if I'm being a bitch or like I'll be like guess what and my boyfriend will be like what you want an Emmy oh d- we didn't know <laughs> and then I always like the bit has gone so far that then someone's like you won an Emmy and I have to like clarify that it was like a regional student award film production thing but you know what I don't care life's hard I want an Emmy I think everyone should yeah. like they want an Emmy There are so many people with Emmys out there. We actually don't think about this. And the Mercy Watson books are not about a teen girl on a broom having the time of her life. It's actually about a little pig having the time of her life. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, she's really living her best life. I think the interesting thing is that, and I didn't know this when I suggested it, but we decided to read 
out of the six, number two and three. So one mm-hmm. may have answered some questions that I had, but I certainly didn't remember it when I suggested that we read these. And I certainly didn't remember it as I was reading. We read number two, Mercy Watson goes for a ride. And number three, Mercy Watson fights crime. I just read the first one half an hour ago. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get through it all because they are 80 pages or so, but it is like half pictures, but I didn't know if I would finish it. And there's not really any questions in that. That one is about um, like Mercy Watson is a pig who lives with a very nice couple, Mr. and Mrs. Watson in uh, suburbia. They seem to be in their 40s, maybe very happy. And the the first book opens with all of that information already assumed. Like it opens with Mercy laying in bed as she's getting tucked in. And the events of that are like Mercy gets up in the middle of the night and hops in bed with the Watsons. And then the bed like breaks the floor and starts to fall through into the first floor. And they're like, Mercy, go get help. And by a, a roundabout series of ways, she does uh, get the fire department there. Okay, so they introduced the fire department in the first one because those guys came out of nowhere in the third one. And I was like, who is Lorenzo? Who is Ned? Why do you assume I know them? There's also the two uh, Lincoln sisters, Baby and Eugenia Lincoln, who live next door uh, and are old ladies. And this is like, I didn't really realize this until reading this book again but one of my favorite genres of characters is two old sisters living next door being grouchy I always want their lore like when did they decide to move in together had they ever not been living together do they date separately and talk about their dates like what's going on because it really was giving lesbian couple and then I remembered that they were they were sisters but yeah. the energy that they have towards each other is just so grouchy. And I love that. And honestly, yeah. Aaron, like, I think we could be that in six Oh, yeah. Years. One sister is very much a grouch and the other sister is like, yes, yes. But then secretly, like, loves that a pig is wandering around. The line yeah. I hi- highlighted was, but secretly, baby Lincoln thinks that a little folly wouldn't be a bad thing. Which yes. is my favorite. Yeah, Kate DiCamillo is really great at vocab words and just very sweet. I read these two books in one sitting and then I think immediately texted you and I was like, that was very healing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just hanging out with you guys. And the I think big we haven't mentioned is that Mercy loves buttered toast and the whole family does. But I feel like we all do too. Like that I was do. a highly, highly relatable aspect of this book. Oh, yeah. I've had three slices of buttered toast today. And I don't know how to say his last name, but the illustrator, Chris Van Dusen. Sure. He should win an award. He should win a Newbery Medal for, like, best depiction of buttered toast in a book. Even, like, the page numbers uh, at the bottom of the page have a little slice of buttered toast around them, at least on my edition, uh, my yes. ebook. Everything is just perfect. The Watsons are so round and rosy and have, like, little little apple apple cheeks and everyone is just so cute and the second book is about mercy uh going for a ride in mr watson's fast car mr watson's favorite thing in life is to drive in his nice car it's mentioned in the first book and i think mrs watson's favorite thing to do in the world is sing to mercy while she's making her buttered toast they have the world figured out yeah they have this pig and they all kind of look related Yes, they do. Obviously, this is not in crayon, but I think he used the same crayon for the pig's skin as the people's skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they all just like really look alike. And this is probably the English teacher inside of me. But I'm like, Mm -hmm. why the choice for this to be a pig and not a child? And what's going on there? And what's the deeper meaning? Actually, I wonder if Kate, there's a little author section and illustrator section at the back of the books. It says, a long time ago, my best friend's son, Luke Bailey, put a toy pig in a toy car and (laughs) put the car around the living room screaming, look, look, pig taking a ride, pig taking a ride. This phrase was repeated with such shocking volume and intensity that it took up permanent residence in my brain. What you hold in your hands is the direct product of Luke's obsession 
and mine a decade or so after the fact. Look, Luke, pig taking a ride. (laughs) (laughs) I just think it's great. Uh, At the end of the first book... She uh, says, Mercy Watson had been in my head for a long time, but I couldn't figure out how to tell her story. One day, my friend Allison was going on and on and on about the many virtues of toast. I listened to her. As I listened to her, I could see Mercy nodding in emphatic agreement. Sometimes you don't truly understand a character until you know what she loves above all else. Wow. It's funny because it feels so wholesome and it's like a very straightforward story, but there's Mm -hmm. these like E elements of it that just kind of make it feel cracked in the sense where you're like, this feels like someone picked out elements from a hat and we're like, all right, it's two absolutely joyous old for like old people who now Mm -hmm. have a pet pig and that pet pig loves buttered toast and then everything goes from there and then they're like and you know what we're gonna add in these wacky side characters who are typically government employees who are not that great at Mm -hmm. their jobs no there is a police officer and two firefighters and in the third book we get a thief leroy Mm -hmm. ninker in the second book, Mercy goes for a ride in uh, Mr. Watson's car and they end up speeding. And uh, the Lincoln sisters have some thoughts about it. And in the third book, Mercy gets up at night because she's hungry and discovers a very small man with a big dream named Leroy Ninker, who is a thief in the kitchen at 54 Dekawu Drive, by the way. It's the specifics that I think are so perfect. It's so and- specific. Dekawu Drive. Oh my goodness. And he, it's just so funny. He starts stealing the toaster, and Mercy hears the toaster and is like, oh my God, it's breakfast time. Buttered toast time. Buttered toast o'clock. So she trots downstairs and sees the thief. And what does she do? She falls asleep, which is relatable. She doesn't fall asleep because she's tired she goes downstairs thinking that there's buttered toast there's no buttered toast and she's like i better go to sleep because if there's no buttered toast what's the point let me read it for chapter five mercy looked around she did not see the toaster she did not see the bread she did not see the butter instead mercy saw a little man wearing a big hat he was not making toast mercy was very disappointed she was also very tired she yawned what was that did you hear that? It, <laughs> it was like a sad kazoo came I mean, out of me. That was, it matched the energy of the, the reading. <laughs> or like a slide whistle. Did you ever have those? Yes, I did. And I do feel like a slide whistle would be like a key plot point in one of these books at some point. Oh my gosh. Yes, there are. I know there are six Mercy Watson books. Let's see what the others Four is Princess in Disguise. Incredible. Mercy Watson thinks like a pig. Not the best. Which I feel like she's been doing this whole time. So I'm I'm mm-hmm. curious. Mercy Watson, something wonky this way comes. Could that be a Halloween theme one? I, it because there's like a drive through movie theater. One of my favorite locations. I'm seeing it now. It really does. It's just like they live in the perfect American town. And the worst of their problems is there's a very sweet pig getting up to antics. There's six Mercy Watson books, but there's also a bunch of tales from Dekawu Drive. So yes. mine says Francine Poulette meets a ghost raccoon is one of them. Where are you going, baby Lincoln is another Eugenia Lincoln and the Unexpected Package, which just sounds like her nightmare is just unexpected. It, yeah. it sounds so dark. Yeah. And then I'm seeing under that from, oh, this is from two years ago, December 2023, Tales from Decca Woo Drive series. Mercy Watson is missing. Oh, well, that's just devastating. There's also September 2022, A Very Mercy Christmas. My favorite thing that Kate... DiCamillo does is she calls Mercy Watson the porcine wonder every time it's the porcine wonder I think there's a moment in book one where someone says that's a pig and they go don't use that language in my home it's porcine wonder or nothing my favorite is so I have a theory that 
Kate DiCamillo is very like anti-police because the officer in this is like a complete buffoon, like absolutely Mm -hmm. stupid. And they scam their way out of the ticket for Mercy Watson illegally speeding while driving the car by offering the police officer buttered toast. It says, laws have been broken, says Officer Tamelio. Pig, shouted Eugenia. Excuse me, says the officer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, I think that's a great little joke. It is. I'm looking at his scene now in Fights Crime. By the way, the way Mercy Watson fights crime is she falls asleep on top of the thief Leroy Ninker. There's an illustration of Leroy Ninker after he's caught. It's on page 62, and it's my favorite illustration that doesn't have Mercy in it. It is this man looking so ashamed. He's got his two little toes pointing together, and he's got his hat off, and he's looking down in shame. And this is brilliant from is our illustrator Tony because Chris. He, Chris, God bless you, Chris, his shadow is the only like uh, part of a background or any sort of setting that we see. And his shadow is in green and it's the grass. Wonderful. Honestly, the illustrations in this are like top tier fun. This illustration of Leroy is exactly how I feel like if I got caught eating the last cookie. Yes. There's an emoji with that face. I don't know how to, it's like you're you're Absolutely. pointing your two toes together. You're ashamed you got caught. It's this. It's the two fingers put yes. together. Two fingers together with your thumbs up in your That's sort of hunched two. in your shoulders. Yes, exactly. Here, the pig did capture the thief, said police officer Bert Tomilello. How it happened, I am not certain. But did it happen? It did. I love the matter of factness of it. Also, one of the things that the Mercy Watson fights crime does for me, it like itches the part of my brain that I didn't realize I had, which is just a love of lists. So like when Leroy is stealing all the things, it just is like he grabbed the juicer, he grabbed the teapot, he grabbed the waffle iron. And it reminded me of the scene in the animated Grinch movie where he's stealing all the things from the Who. And it's like a dozen eggs, a light bulb, a this and that. And apparently I just have a need to read lists of things that people are stealing from other people's homes. Oh my gosh. I am, for this podcast right now, I'm rereading Huckleberry Finn, which is one of the strangest reading experiences so far. It's just like whiplash. It's like boxcar children meets like hardcore child abuse and the N word. It's a lot. But in that, he like keeps running away. And so he'll list like he grabbed this from this room and this from that room and that room. And I sort of like I respect that we're getting a full inventory of all of his items because I'm sure that will, you know, be helpful later. But I hate reading them. I'm really a plot motivated reader, certainly. So I think I like what it does for me is it's I think the lore, it's this reason why I like resource management games now, where I'm like, okay, the Oregon Trail, like we need to have four blankets to make it across the prairie. I'm going to play house flipper and I need to buy all this like brick to build this home, whatever. I think it comes from that. I'm like, I just want to know how much stuff people have on them. Mm. I want a list of your stuff. There's an illustration of Mr. Watson and Mercy in the car, and they're having the time of their lives. Also, his car is like a bubblegum pink convertible with chrome detailing. And like, that was the go-to image of a car in my brain. And I think it's because of Barbie and this. The illustrator just has this style that makes everything feel like it's gleaming. Yes, like shiny. In something like having, I feel like, very minimal texture, it's so tactile. Mm -hmm. I just want to squeeze everything. Also, in the first picture in the book, another thing I love is just looking at all the food that they're eating because for breakfast, they are having (laughs) buttered toast, a full rotisserie chicken, green jello or aspic with stuff floating in it, an entire pyramid of tea sandwiches, a lasagna. I think it's either a bunny made out of rice, but I think it's actually like an Easter bunny cake with like coconut on it. 
a bowl of fruit, mm -hmm. a charcuterie board that is just a piece of Swiss cheese, a bay bell, and spray cheese, which is actively spraying, and then mashed potatoes. The thing in my mind is it's meant to look like the Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving painting mm -hmm. that's all very vertical. But like, because I started with this book first, that was my first image of this book series. And I was like, I'm in a safe place. It makes you feel like, oh, I want that to be my home. And even though I do not want fruit floating in aspic for breakfast, I like kind of would be comforted by it. Yeah. I feel like we've talked about this probably because we both have family in and around Kentucky. Did you ever have ambrosia? That's yeah. like everyone should go try it. Yeah, that I'm was like the only fruit you're going to get when you're visiting your grandparents. It's not fruit unless it's drenched in Cool Whip. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Not fruit. On page six, my favorite image in the whole book is this really nefarious looking image of Mercy <laughs> Watson where Mercy Watson is trying to drive the car and they're like, Mercy Watson, you are fantastic, but you are a pig, so you cannot drive this car. And they're like, if you get out of the passenger seat, we'll make you toast when you get home. And Mercy narrows her eyes and then it says she loves hot buttered toast. She also loves extra helping. And this picture they drew of her was the first time where I was like, this might be a pigskin suit with an evil man living inside of it who's eating their toast. Like there's something so dark about this photo to me. And I really kind of think that like Mercy knows what's up. Like she's taking advantage of this situation. Look at that. Why would you say that? <laughs> Look, I was having such a nice time. <laughs> there is something dark there. <laughs> there is something and dark. also <laughs> it's so important to know that Mercy's eyebrows and the tips of her ears are purple. Yeah, which is a bizarre choice, but I love it. I do. Especially because it, like, other than the fact that, like, there is... No, I was going to say, like, they're pretty realistic images. They're not. That's actually <laughs> false. They <laughs> feel real. They simultaneously they... feel real, and I also feel like it's Meet the Robinsons. Exactly. There's something about, like, the head shapes and the eyes. Yeah. This is, by the way, at least the first uh, Mercy Watson is from 2005. Honestly, the art style really holds up. Oh, yeah. And I love Baby. <laughs> <laughs> when I started reading the, the first book, I had forgotten about that character because I read these a couple weeks ago. So when I was reading it today, I didn't see the illustration first. So a chapter just started and it was like, Baby Lincoln is feeling this and that. And I was like, excuse me? Do you picture baby, baby Abraham, Abraham Lincoln? Lincoln? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, who's this old woman? <laughs> Literally, who? This book is actually how I would teach fundamentals of screenwriting to like a group of middle schoolers because she kills it with the A plot, B plot, C plot. Like it's so clear to see. And I'm mm -hmm. like an ensemble cast that comes together. This could be a sitcom. Oh my gosh. The fact that it's not an animated TV series, but I do realize I never asked, how did this book come into your life? What's your story with it? You know what? I could not tell you to save my life. So a lot of people in my life are having babies right now, which is wild to me, but really just adorable, cute, cute little humans that are going to have to read soon. And I think because I, I work a very political job where I hear a lot about like book banning and censorship, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about like books that I would really want kids to read. And I like gifting books with little notes in them to oh. readers. So I was looking at lists of like best kids books from maybe like 2000 to 2008 and yeah. this was one of them and I could have never told you that this was a book that I read until I saw this picture of a pig in a car and I was like that unlocked an entire area of my brain and I was like I loved this pig. Um, Wait, did you grow and I know you grew up in Manhattan so you mm -hmm. probably didn't Oh, this restaurant that it was in my suburban mall but did you ever go to the silver diner no okay 
I was in the Baltimore Washington International Airport the other day and they had a silver diner in it. And I used to go to one all the time in this rundown mall. It was like very retro, 50s soda fountain. And they would give the kids like a kids menu coloring sheet wrapped up with a little thing of crayons inside uh, like a cardboard car that looks exactly like Mr. Watson's car. That was like a classic old school. It was awesome. And it was like five in the morning or something. And I was in BWI and my boyfriend pointed it out and I was like, oh, but they're going to have the cars. Do they still? Ha-? And I was like, it's five in the morning and I'm not say I'm not in my right mind, but I was hovering. It's strange how much can live in your brain. And like, there's no reason I should be able to remember this pig from 20 years ago, if not more. And I think it speaks a lot to the illustrator that it sticks in my head. Like, it's such a definitive thing. And the minute I saw the pig, I hadn't read the title yet. And I was like, that's Mercy Watson, the pig. And I was like, why do I know that? Erin, I couldn't. You remember the ongoing gag that I couldn't list more than like four U.S. presidents in college? That hasn't changed. I think it's five now because there was another president elected. I think that's why we get along so well. Very complimentary. But I don't know the president, but I know Mercy Watson, the pig. So listen, we all have different skills. And ultimately, which will make you happier? Absolutely, Mercy Watson. Let's all vote for Mercy Watson this November. Oh, I already turned in my ballot. No. Mercy Watson takes the (laughs) Oval Office. Oh, my God. Did you ever read the other? I'm trying to think about other uh, children's books of our era that are about pigs. There's Olivia the pig. Was there any others? If you give a pig a pancake. Um, Yes. Yeah, which is interesting because there's also another thread I've I've chased on this podcast is how many books there are about like children's books about mice and rats, and mm-hmm. that um, Tale of Despero, also by Kate DiCamillo, is about a little mouse with his ears are too big. You know, I'm all about like a conspiracy theory. Yes, and because I work in advertising, I'm like I really just think like big mouse went out to all these children's writers and were like we got to make mice more popular and so they like fed a bunch of mice propaganda into the the zeitgeist Mm -hmm. um that's what that like is what makes me happy i don't care if it's true or not oh charlotte's web another famous charlotte's web you're 100 percent right interesting no one's asked to do that one yet and there was a movie about that a around our age a really I devastating family. movie like do, do you ever do you ever remember like childhood movies that give you something akin to the ick in your soul where you're like for some reason that was so devastating and it's like nostalgic to a point that almost hurts no i don't think so or like are you t- like specific like I know there's the there's the one w- with the kid in the glasses who dies maybe of a bee sting. Like I know that's one that everyone w- give an example please. Like uh <laughs> like Bambi's one of them. Like the opening uh, scene is so traumatic that the rest of the movie is just colored by that or um do you remember Chicken Run? The most horrifying claymation movie of all time that is about one of my group- favorites. Ugh. But okay, she well, is terrifying. For you. It's a terrifying movie. It's just about chickens unionizing so that they don't get murdered, brutally murdered. Yes. I chicken run. What's hilarious is that like my so I never watched Bambi for that reason. My parents were like, we're not going to traumatize our child like that. And I feel like a lot of the big ones like that I just missed. But how like I don't even know if she did this consciously but my mother who spent like all of the 90s studying Russian political science how hilarious it is that she raised me on chicken run about chickens unionizing and a picture book called click clack mood cows that type which is also about cows unionizing okay so I swear click clack moo is the inspiration for all of chick-fil-a's marketing because it's just cows getting together to throw chicken under the bus so that the cows are free to live happy little lives in their fields while chickens are slaughtered. Well, damn. 
why is this all I talk about is like advertising schemes and the deeper social meanings behind children's books? I think everyone's job, no matter how much they like it, does end up melting your brain a little bit. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Advertising has changed me so much because I'll stand in an aisle and pick up something and I'm like, I want this. And then I go, or... Does someone at a big table far off want me to want it? And then I get very confused and overstimulated and leave the store. I'm looking at Mercy Watson goes for a ride right now, just looking at the pictures. They're all going back into the Watsons' homes for buttered toast, Officer Tomalello and the Lincoln sisters. And the Lincoln sisters are holding hands. And like baby is talking, like trying to calm down Eugenia, who's shaking her finger. But they are holding hands to cross a yard. And I love that. That's adorable. Also, Eugenia, for all her her no nonsenseness, does have blue hair. Yes. Which I used to think just happened. I didn't realize that that was not natural. I realize now. But old ladies get blue hair? Yeah, because like my grandma, I mean, one of my grandmas just always had gray hair and my other grandma had bright red hair. Later, I found out it was a wig because later she had cancer. But I think I was just like something about it. I was like, oh, no, she's just naturally her hair is naturally that color and it just hasn't gone yet. Would you dye your hair? I feel like I just have to wait and see how it suits me. Like what yeah. it looks like on my face. I uh, just turned 28 and I'm starting to go gray. So that's that's going to be fun little <laughs> reality. But I know I'm not going gray in the way that I want to, which is Stacey London from What Not to Wear. Oh, yeah. I saw something online. I wanted to say an article, but I'm pretty sure it's a TikTok and I'm pretty sure it's just a meme and not a fact. But it was like, <laughs> thank God I work in a corporate office now when the worst thing that can happen is you get canceled instead of working in a corporate office 20 years ago when the worst thing that could happen is all of your coworkers could collectively decide to call what not to wear on you. Yes. And 20 years before that, it was the McCarthy trials. Mm. Yeah. And before that, witch burnings. What? Do you think you would be burned as a witch? Um, I hope not. But here's the thing. Like throughout my life, I've noticed a pattern of people telling me I'm intimidating. And I feel like that would work against me in that situation. Yeah. What about you? Because of the time period, I would not be on the antipsychotics that I need to function. So mm. I think morbidly, I would be down with ending it all. And if I was going to end it all, I think that I would go around telling people I was a witch. Yeah. Just to fuck with them. In writing this um, like religious horror movie, I sort of came to the conclusion and probably other people have thought of this before and I'm intoxicated so I won't say it well but like if you are a teen girl in like an extremely sexist religious conservative patriarchal society the only way that you can like have people listen to you is say it's God speaking through you Mm-hmm. And once you realize that, of course, you're going to kind of lose it. Like once you finally so quickly gain that power, not spiritually, but like socially, mm. of course, you're going to you're a teen girl. No, that's a good point. And I do feel like there's something to like when you really commit to a lie, you do start believing it yourself. So if you're going around being like God speaks through me, you're going to start to like internalize that And then you just have like this made up manifested external influence in your brain. And that's a power trip. Yes. I've been in such a reading slump. So it was honestly nice to read these Mercy Watson books. I was like reading and it's like 80 point font. So Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, I'm a speed reader. I'm really getting through this. Look at me go. Exactly. (laughs) Like sitting reading 80 pages of Wuthering Heights is daunting, but I can just flip through. I just think anyone who needs a confidence boost should just pick up a middle grade book and fly through it and be like, I'm the smartest eighth grader in the whole world. If it's the right book, it's such a hard, in a beautiful way, such a hard reset on your day. I think in corporate offices and maybe just people's homes, we 
should actually continue to have a little like they had them in classrooms, like little bookshelf in the corner with a little like beanbag and a carpet that you can just take a little reading break and like reset and then come back to your desk. I think we were really on to something there. I do think reading Pat the Bunny would fix me. Mm-hmm. Like we all yeah. just need a little sensory, sensory moment. More oh if adult books had fun little textures in them, I'd read more. There is a reason that they published like a 25th anniversary gold Egyptology because those books had something in them. I loved the dragon one with the green crystal. Yes. I mean, it was plastic, but to me, it was a crystal. And that book made me feel wealthy. Yes. It was too big to fit in a backpack. Yeah. And I was like, this is my tome. And I think we should bring back tomes because tomes make you feel cool. Like, Mm. let's stop saying cigarettes make you look cool, even though they do. And let's bring back tomes. Yes. And illuminated manuscripts. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be sick. All my tattoos are, like, kind of in the style of illuminated manuscripts, and I need more of them. And I just think that was a a fun period in time where we were all drawing collectively. Yeah. I love sometimes they're like a man is reading something. So his like whole spine like curves over mm-hmm. to read something. In sixth grade, I think we learned about illuminated manuscripts and we had like a weird like media arts kind of uh, class that was sort of free form a little bit. And when we were learning about illuminated manuscripts in like English and history, the unit in our media class was you all have to sit and do illuminated manuscripts with calligraphy pens and parchment and no one can speak and we're going to play Gregorian chants the whole time. Okay, this and- speaks to how different our educations were because I didn't learn about illuminated manuscripts until my freshman year of college and we did not do the Gregorian chants. When we found out we were going to play Gregory or like listen to Gregorian chants, I know there was one kid who was like, yes, who was like, I love that shit. And I was friends with that kid for like six years and I shouldn't have been. He was mean. I feel like Gregorian chants is a red flag. Like if you're really, into, need- there's nothing wrong with the music. I just mm-hmm. think like there's something wrong. As like, with yes. I even see like some. Like, religious music and even, like, Christian Catholic music can be gorgeous. Maybe I've just seen it in horror settings too much. That's what happened to me with the violin. (gasps) No! The most, one of the most beautiful instruments. A plucky violin, it just is, like, someone's around the corner. Do you know the musical instrument where it's, like, two pieces of wood and you just slap them together? I think it's actually called a slapstick. No, but I do like that. I recently learned what a cajon is, which is just a box you sit on and then play like drums. And it's like built differently. It's not just a box. But at first I was like, ooh, an instrument you can sit on and play. That sounds so awesome and not like standing is involved. And then you have to hunch over a lot to play it. And I was like, this is giving illuminated manuscript. Just your spine all out of whack. But I had never heard of that before. I just learned that from you about the instrument. It's on the list of instruments that I could maybe potentially learn. Anything with oh. strings is out. Anything percussion is a hard maybe. Mm. It's going to be dinner time very soon in yeah. the time zone. And I really am tempted to make hot buttered toast. Do it. I made bread. Do it. Nothing is traumatic, really, in in Mercy Watson and her world. Maybe there's always a small threat of danger, but it's like... I mean, she goes missing. Well, we haven't read that one. That's so true. I do think the most traumatic thing that happened is not the home invasion, but the fact that when she woke up, there was no hot buttered toast. Like, I think that's the extent of trauma in her world. And that's really nice. Yeah. Nice to vacation in that reality. Especially because she gets probably within an hour, she does get toast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all solved. 
it's neat. Everyone is like well-intentioned, mostly. Eugenie is a little on the fence, literally, because she's their neighbor. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited to like post the images related to this oh, episode. Yeah. I do think you should just screen cap me holding up one of the images for <laughs> the Instagram post. What do you think is your favorite? Is it the the mischievous pig, your favorite illustration in these? Uh, I do love the mischievous pig, but I really do think it's the Leroy picture. It's just so <laughs> iconic. <laughs> yeah. This is a close one, too, because have you ever seen a picture that radiates that much joy? No, it's it's Mercy and uh, Mr. Watson having the biggest smiles on their faces in the bubble gum. Is it a Cadillac? I think I... it's a Cadillac. Yep, a 1959 convertible Cadillac. Ooh, brand name. It says it in My... um, the author's bio. Mm. Or, sorry, the illustrator's bio. I think the first image in goes for a drive which is the the sort of thanksgiving one with the aspic and everything that might be my favorite one i know that this is probably a reading sin but i've gotten really into junk journaling lately and sure i do think i'm gonna commemorate us doing this episode by cutting out some of the images in this book that's okay i give you permission Thank you, you didn't need it but i know i need that sometimes no, i kind of did because it feels very illegal to rip pages out of a book Mm -hmm. but also I'm using art to make different art so I think that's okay and you can buy another one if need be that's so true I love this picture in the second book Mrs. Watson gets Eugenia to butter toast with her and Eugenia looks so grumpy and so determined but I like at the end where her sister's like we should go eat buttered toast with everyone. And Eugenia's like, well, it has been expertly buttered. I get her. Yes. Do you think of the two of us, you're Eugenia and I'm baby or the opposite? I think we're both both. Yeah. Is it like, <laughs> is it like the thing they say about Winnie the Pooh that is to me definitely not true where they're like, every character is a different mental illness. Eeyore is like depression yes in reality everyone has all the characters of the mercy watson universe inside of them like i know we both specifically have made that little mercy watson sneaky in the car face i feel like we've seen each other make those face at target or something Mm -hmm. absolutely oh i had a question when i was reading this which is who would you cast in the live action remake oh gosh So the first thing that comes to mind for Mrs. Watson, and I don't know if I'm 100% on it, is Christina Applegate. Hmm, I could see that. But I almost want it to be Christina Applegate in 10 years. Yes. Yes, I see. I don't know about... It's like I need to see a lineup of people. Leroy would have been great for Martin Short like 30 years ago. Okay, you know the kid who played Rico in Hannah Montana who's in the new Fallout show yes yes that's Leroy yes I think his name is Moises Arias I feel like he's Leroy I feel like Maggie Smith would be a great a great Eugenia Mm. rest in peace rest in peace who would you do as baby she's just so cute like I don't and so like so vertical so like for narrow some reason this is completely wrong my brain went sabrina carpenter of course which is just like out of pocket <laughs> here's what it should be sabrina carpenter is baby and charlie xcx is lincoln and chapel roan is mercy chapel roan is mercy because of the cover of good luck babe she has the pig yes, nose right exactly i got exactly. another conspiracy yeah. Troy Savon is uh Mr. Watson. I feel like Troy Savon is baby Lincoln. There you go. <laughs> Mercy Watson the musical. Oh my gosh, who even though Julian Baker is tiny, would Julian Baker be Eugenia? I could see that. Eugenia and Phoebe. Mm, yeah. Aaron, you should write the script for Mercy Watson. <laughs> and then at the end you always end it with hot buttered toast. Exactly. And there's so much like we have not in the Mercy Watson world 
I feel like we really have not seen anything past Dekalu Drive. So there's a huge universe out there. I imagine Dekalu Drive as a cul-de-sac with just like a ton of different wacky characters on it. So it would be like the perfect fodder for a TV show. Exactly. (sighs) Yes. I also, one of the things I liked about this book, and maybe this is just because like I'm curmudgeon-y, I really liked that Mercy Watson didn't talk. Like she just oinks. Mm Mm-hmm. I like that too. I really like There's something about talking animals that just I don't like. They can't talk. I'm sorry. Coming back to our old screenwriting lessons, it really is a thing of show don't tell. Like those Mm -hmm. images speak plenty for Mercy. Yeah. And she oinks at the right time. Like Kate Uh, DiCamillo. But I always love that it's Mercy says and then in quotes, oink. Yeah. It's always active. Mercy says it's never oink. Like said Mercy choice yeah. of hers, which I think shows that she's not just oinking; she's actually communicating. She just doesn't need human English to communicate. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think like the Watsons and Mercy ever have like a miscommunication. I think that always frustrated me. In I think I just like got frustrated easily and (laughs) so um, like Amelia Bedelia definitely frustrated me because I think in that it was like you're not giving her good instructions. I was like Amelia Bedelia just works for people who don't know how to like give instructions like tell her what to do. Also I'm sorry if you hire Amelia Bedelia you know her deal so maybe be more specific or don't hire her. Like, read the reviews. They're setting her up for failure. A lot of sympathy in this house for Amelia Bedelia. Oh, yeah. She was done dirty. And she she had a good outfit. I loved the outfit. I love Mrs. Watson's hair. It is like wings sticking straight out of her head. It's so Hey Arnold coded. I would love a Amelia Bedelia mercy watson crossover because i feel like amelia bedelia could live on deca amelia bedelia on deca drive she would like finally be at peace yeah i would love that yeah and everyone like comes over for toast on sunday nights or sunday morning brunch at the watson place and you can't misinterpret hot buttered toast how she would find a way that girl's so crazy she's wacky wacky this was so much fun and there's so much joy in these i am always down to read a children's book would you consider it required reading um i think that if you like joy yes (laughs) (laughs) if you don't like joy fuck off you don't need to read this book exactly if you don't like joy you probably won't like this book either i feel like This book is definitely required for me, and I feel like it should be required that adults, like, read a children's book for themselves, like, minimum once a month. Like, including picture books. Just, like, sit down. (laughs) Sit down with, like, green eggs and ham. God bless you. Oh, absolutely. I think that it also... My favorite thing about reading a kid's book is often... This was the first time I was experiencing or being exposed to something... Like before this book, probably never thought about a Cadillac. And then all of a sudden, that's my starting memory of a Cadillac. And it's so bizarre. And I think that reading kids books makes you remember the first time you ever figured something out. Like uh, one thing that always sticks out is um, in series of unfortunate events. That's why I know what Tagolatelli is. Yeah, yeah. I had never thought about it before. I didn't even know Tagliatelle existed. And then all of a sudden, Count Olaf was like, make that. And I was like, my world just expanded. Oh, I'm trying to think of things like that. But like Click Clack Moo might have been the first time I saw a typewriter or electric blankets. Maybe Mm -hmm. I feel like I probably had them, but just didn't. Yeah. The first time I found I understood an electric blanket was Blanky in Brave Little Toaster. Wow, I never saw a brave little toaster. Erin, you should watch that. That is you coded. Like you are the <laughs> toaster. I am. <laughs> wow, oh. you need to read that. I that's required watching for you. Is there anything uh, you'd like to plug? Yeah. If you like music, 
you should listen to the band that I'm a secret member of. It's called Limestone Love Seat. You can find it everywhere on the internet that most people are. We just released a song called One Crack, and it's about how my boyfriend kept almost dying as a kid. And I was like, you were really one crack away from death. And so we wrote an entire song about it. And it's very like, it's not metal, but it's, it's, there's a lot of screaming in it. And I love that. Mm, nice. So give it a listen. We need the streams desperately. All musicians need the streams. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I love doing this. So in thank a year, you. I'll be back. Thank you so much to Adrian. Our next episode is going to be about weathering heights. And then maybe Huck Finn. And then maybe a book about witches, which I thought this book was going to be. But um, it was about a beautiful, wonderful pig. Uh, you can find me everywhere at Aaron R. Bowles. And please, if you feel so inclined, support the podcast at buymeacoffee.com slash required reading. That's my cat, Texas. Will he say more? Texas! He ran away. All right, bye.